Hey everybody, Johnny Cage here, welcoming you back to another game review. This time we're taking a look at Rygar, developed and published by Tecmo, released in July of 1987 for the NES. In this action-adventure game, you will play as the Warrior of Argus, a long-dead hero that has been brought back to life for the sole purpose of destroying the villainous Lygar and his minions, with the aid of his disc armor, which is basically just a giant yo-yo. Of course, the only way that you would know any of this is by reading the instruction manual, as the game wastes no time dropping you into the action, running to the right, striking down enemies, and occasionally climbing ropes and jumping gaps, trying to pick up any hints you can on where to go to complete your quest. Hints that you can easily come across by stopping in at these doorways, where this super buff Santa looking guy will give you some info on what to do next, though in traditional NES fashion, these tips can be kind of cryptic. Also, sometimes he has a thing on his head. Pretty sure it's supposed to be his third eye, but I'll let you be the judge of that. For now, just keep heading to the right, and soon enough you'll reach Grand Mountain, and just when you think that you're getting a feel for the adventure aspect of this game, you get hit with a curveball by going through this door only to find that there's an entire overworld for you to explore. No need to be overwhelmed though, the game isn't trying to pull a Zelda on you. In fact, the world isn't all that big, and if you want a questionably useful illustration of the whole thing, you can find it online with a quick search. To complete our quest and bring peace back to the world, we ultimately have to defeat five bosses ruling over five different and rather distinct sections before we can take on the dreaded Ligar. These consist of the forest-dwelling Aruga and his triple shot of deadly ovals, Seglia, a giant spider hidden in the caves that you can pretty easily take out once you get a rhythm going, Dorago held up in his castle firing winged eyeballs at you, Garba who can be found guarding his tower fortress, and lastly Lapis who controls the Sky Realm. After defeating each of these bosses, our old buff friend will bestow upon us a different key item which we will need to gain entry into the game's final area. But the normal baddies of the world are not going to make it easy on us. There are plenty of them, and usually they quickly spawn in front of you, causing you to have to react immediately to what pops up on screen. At least these enemies can be easily avoided or dealt with. Our hero has some pretty good jump height for getting around them, and landing on top of most of these guys will cause them to be stunned for a bit, giving you a nice bounce as well. While being able to dodge enemies is useful and all, you are going to want to take out as many of them as you can, since this game actually has a level up system to it, and you'll want to be as strong as possible for some of the tougher bosses. And if you thought navigating the overworld was tough, just try calculating your character's strength. Opening up the start menu will display your tone, which is tied to your attack power, and last, which is your defensive power. If you want to gauge your level and how much damage you're actually doing, you'll want to take your tone divided by 8 rounded down, which is probably more trouble than it's worth, but increasing the result of that equation will determine whether you have actually leveled up or not. Increasing your level will also provide you with more health, granting you 12 health circles in total should you bother to grind to that extent. And if you should perish on your adventure, the game is quite forgiving in starting you off at the beginning of the last area you had entered. One minor knock against the game is that some areas do have respawning baddies to contend with, and while that's usually a drag in most games, you can actually use it to your advantage to do some quick leveling up if you would like. My favorite spots being this hallway on your way to fight Dorago, and this one which is conveniently right before the final boss. Once you feel that you're up to the task, it's time to take on the main bad guy himself, Ligar. And even at full power, he isn't a pushover. Your best bet is to use the special move Attack and Assail, which requires six star bits you have likely been picking up along the way, and will damage everything on the screen for a short while. Use that until it runs out of juice, finishing him off with a few more blows if need be, as we get treated to the wonderful end screen featuring a lone bird and three color rainbow, the design team clearly sparing no expense in making sure the player feels rewarded for completing their quest. The whole game sounds like it would take quite a while to complete, with a world to explore and grinding to be had, but it's actually a pretty quick affair, and can be completed in under an hour once you start to get a feel for the lay of the land and the mechanics therein. Though for your first time, you're probably going to want to check out a walkthrough, or even a speedrun to help you along the way and mitigate the frustration of getting totally lost. The controls in the game are actually rather tight and responsive, which they kind of need to be considering how often enemies will just jump right out at you, and most of the time you can get out of some pretty sticky situations completely unscathed. I did have some issues though, mostly related to the hit detection on rope items, such as trying to use the zipline to get across the water here, and having to jiggle the d-pad around to find the sweet spot to actually connect while trying not to fall to my death. Otherwise, the controls aren't anything that you wouldn't expect for an early NES title. A jumps and B uses your massive yo-yo of death, but that's it, making it an easy game to jump right on into. The visuals speak for themselves. One look and you know you're definitely dealing with an early third-party NES game here. The colors are not its strong suit, but they are at least varied enough that you can distinguish enemies from backgrounds and platforms. 
Though there are a couple oddities for sure, like the sprites in the final area being a solid gray color, not sure if that was a design choice or time and money became a factor in that decision. In fact, at the start of this part, if you take a leap of faith to the left, you can enter this out-of-bounds zone where you can freely walk about, though I've never really discovered anything worthwhile here. Also, when fighting the final boss, if you still have the attack and assail power active when you finish him off, the screen will be stuck on the white flash of the move being executed, which carries over into the end screen where our bird friend is now a mere three pixels, and sadly there's no rainbow at all. The audio doesn't fare a whole lot better than the graphics. There are some decent tunes throughout the game, and maybe even some good music every now and again, but this game does perhaps feature the worst track in any NES game ever when you enter the Palace of Durago. Oh man, is that something special. These days you can pick up a cart of Rygar on the original Nintendo for about $15 American on eBay, and if this adventure wasn't enough Rygar for ya, there actually was another one released in the form of Rygar the Legendary Adventure on the PS2, a whole 15 years after the original came out. Look, there's no way around it. Rygar on the NES is janky with a capital J, but damn does it wear that crown proudly. I'm gonna go ahead and give Rygar 4 killer yo-yos out of 10. I know that this looks bad, and it doesn't sound too great either, but even so, it does control pretty well and is likely a designer's attempt at their own Legend of Zelda style game only a couple years after the classic was released. I can't help but give the game an overall low score, but honestly this isn't a bad title. In fact, it might be the jankiest game on the NES worth playing. There are quite a few other games on the Nintendo that attempted to craft a world to explore and ultimately failed because they made the experience too convoluted and frustrating to manage through. Here, even without a proper guide, you should be able to see it through to the end, and I would encourage anyone that enjoys 8-bit adventure games to give this one a try for themselves. Thank you everyone for watching, and if you'd like to stay posted on new game reviews as I upload them, please click the subscribe button, as well as checking out the link in the description below for my Twitch channel where I stream most days. I'll talk to you all later on.